Hello everyone, hope everyone is doing well. Today we're going to talk about different types of data that we have that we see on a regular basis and how we can graphically or visually show the data so that we can get a better understanding of that data set. So first, let's talk about the different types of data that we may come across. There are three basically, basically three types of data that we see on a regular basis. One is a cross-section data, the other one is time series, and the third one is panel. Cross-section data, this data is basically about, it has one entity per line, which means that we have a huge spreadsheet like this of data. Um, maybe we're storing the data in Microsoft Excel or in some kind of other spreadsheet or database. And each line has a separate entity's data. So let's look at an example. Let's say we have one column with ID. Then maybe we have name. And then we have probably salary. And we have experience. So we may have, this is probably, let's say, the database of all the employees in a company. And we may look at their, and this is what their salary is. So we may have someone, John M, Jane K, Chris L, Mary R, and Susan R. And then we have their salary. So we have probably 40K, 45K, 30K, 67k and let's say 50k and we have their experience which is let's say four three six seven eight and eight so in cross-section data as you notice as you can see each line has a different person's data so john m's data is in law uh, is id one and this only has john M m's data Mary R's data is in line number four, and so this only has Mary's data. And so we may have other types of uh, cross-section data. It could be like on different countries if I'm collecting maybe, let's say, average income in different countries in a specific period of time, so then that would be cross-section data. Time series, on the other hand, this is the data of one entity over time. And this kind of data is usually used in macroeconomics to study different um, economic related data like inflation, unemployment, economic growth, per capita income. So let's say we have a country like USA and we have year and we have, let's say, per capita income. So we collect data for each year and so forth until let's say 2022. And we have the per capita income of each of those years collected. And this is an example of time series data. Now, what about data that has like maybe of different individuals over time? In economics or in statistics, we call that panel data. In other cases, it is also called longitudinal data. In some places, it is called longitudinal data. Now, this data is basically has, it follows different individuals over time. So it does not only follow one person over time, like time series, it follows different individuals over time. So again, let's see if I have ID, and this maybe I have name, and let's say GPA. So another thing I'll need is and year and GPA. So maybe this person is has an ID of one. So ID of one has, let's say their name is again, John M. 
John M. And year is, let's say, fall 21, spring 22, fall 22, and spring 23. And we have some information about John M's GPA, so 3.2, 3.4, 3.3, 3.1. Now the next line is someone else and I have someone with ID number two. So let's say that is Jane K. And again, we may have the same time periods data and we have Jane K's GPA over time. So probably like, let's say it's 3.4, 3.5, 3.5. 3.1 and then in the next line we have someone else's data and so forth so this kind of data is what we call panel data or longitudinal data here if you notice like we have one person being followed over time now here we have the same person being followed for four consecutive semesters if every individual is followed every for the set number of years, and it's called a balanced panel data, but that's not necessarily happening. It may be that we only have three semesters data for John and four semesters data for Jane, and then maybe Mary has five semesters worth of data, and that's called an unbalanced panel data. But basically, it is they're still panel because we are following different individuals or different entities over time. So after that, so th these are the three types of data that we see on a regular basis. So cross-section is basically, if you look at panel data, if I look at one specific time or year, that would be cross-section data. Time series is following one entity over time. And then finally, we have panel data, which is following different entities over different time periods. Then we come to the idea of, uh, the other two types of data that we face is called qualitative data and quantitative data. Let's look at quantitative data first. Quantitative data is data that can be measured. So quantitative data is data that can be measured. So examples are like income, my height, um, distance, Let's say if I look at macroeconomic data, uh, inflation, like this is what I can say is data that can be represented by a number. So I can say that someone's income is $70,000 a year. So that tells me, gives me a number saying that how big is that person's income. A distance of maybe 40 miles, the person I know that how far that distance is, or I can at least imagine how far that distance. Qualitative data, on the other hand, is data that we cannot really represent by a number or data that cannot be measured. So qualitative data is data that cannot be represented by a number. Some examples of qualitative data is probably like race, ethnicity of a person can uh, see that it exists, but it cannot be represented by a number. We can also probably like brands of companies. So let's say we have like car brands. We have GM, Toyota, Ford, BMW. Now these are different car brands. They produce different cars. They produce different unique cars. And there are ways to figure out which car has better safety record ratings or anything or things like that. But usually it's people's preferences that distinguish and it's how the companies kind of market those products that tells us what kind of a car GM is and Ford is. So let's look at some qualitative data. Let's look at qualitative data. How do we represent qualitative data or how do we show qualitative data visually. Let's say this is an, uh, a survey data of the different holiday destinations people are planning to visit. 
in either the summer or in the upcoming uh, holiday season. So we have these four destinations. Now we know that we have here 21 observations. So we can, we is showing this row of data can be cumbersome because it doesn't really tell us which destination is more popular. So one way we can do is, is we can calculate the frequency of the, each of those destinations. So out of the 21 people that we surveyed, how many chose California, how many chose Florida, how many chose New York, and how many chose Washington, D.C.? We could count it. And since it's a smaller data set, we can actually count it. We could hold the um, icon or the um, cursor over here and then move down. And I can see that there are seven um, rows, uh, seven call, uh, rows of California data. Or what I can do is, or I could write seven here, or an easier way of doing it is if I write count if, and then it's asking me what the range is. So once I open the parenthesis, I go and I highlight all the data that I want to look, I want Excel to look into. And then I say comma, and then the criteria is for me is California. And then I close the parenthesis. And it's telling me that California has seven entities or seven people recorded California as their top travel destination. I can do the same thing for Florida. So I can say count if same range and then comma, I can say Florida. And then the same thing with New York. And finally, So I missed a uh, parenthesis. Uh, I did not close my uh, quotes. So that's why I got an error message. Now this is giving me the frequency of each of those entries and I can sum them. And this gives me the total number of survey ent entries. So which is 21, which is good. So let me copy the formulas so that people can see what I did. And then, so now from here I can draw a graph. So I can highlight my um, the boxes that I want uh, Excel to use to draw the graph. And then I go to and then I can go to insert. And then I can click on the type of the chart I want to do. Now I can go to recommended charts, but I think it would be better if I do a bar chart. And this is giving me the frequency of each of those holiday destination. So it's showing that California is the highest, Florida is the second or the third, New York is the second, DC is, is the same as Florida. So this is one way we can summarize the data. So instead of showing this column of data when we are presenting the data, this gives us a little more intuition. It helps us to visualize and see which data has the highest frequency. Now, frequency is okay to do, but sometimes if we have a lot of data, it may be hard for a person to visualize it because maybe I have 50,000 survey results. And then putting that in a frequency chart like this and then visualizing may be a little difficult. So what I do, what I can do is I can run up or show a relative frequency chart, which is the same as this frequency chart that I have, except that instead of looking at the actual frequencies, I convert each of the frequencies as a percent of the total. So for, so for California, it would be that is seven divided by the total number of entries or survey results that I have. And this is giving me a number of 0.333 or 33.3%, which is telling me that out of all the survey result that I have, 33% said that they preferred California as their top 
travel destination. Now one thing I can do is I would like to copy this formula down. I can pull it down but when I pull this down here I get an error message. Now why do I get an error message? It's telling me that it moved to the second one which I want but it also moved the denominator down one below which I do not want. I want the denominator to be fixed at 21. So what I can do is I can go up here and for the denominator I can put a dollar sign in front of F and in front of 9 which tells state uh, which tells Excel that fix F9. So when I move it down you do not change F9. F9 remains as is as the denominator. So then I when I pull it all down I get all these numbers. So I can also check them just to make sure New York is 6 divided by 21 which is right and I need to update this formula again so that if you want to try it out you can see it so that's the formula. And so the total would be equals to sum. It's a good thing always to check the total because since it's a relative frequency they should all add up to 1. Now from here I can do the same thing. I can highlight this um, rows and columns and then I go to insert and um, I, I choose column and now this gives me a relative frequency chart which is a little more helpful to see because I now can see that over 30 percent of the people want want to go to California are a little less than or 30 percent or about 28 percent of the people want to go to New York and around 19 percent want to go to Florida and 19 percent want to go to Washington DC. So this gives us an idea of the frequency, relative frequency of my answers or my data. Now this is one way we, these are some of the ways actually we can visualize qualitative data. In quantitative data too we can visualize it. So let's look at one example. Let's say this is a data set I have of how long do people commute in minutes. Now when I did qualitative data I already had some fixed bands. In quantitative data it gets a little harder because now now that we have this data set of quantitative data that is talking about how to uh, how many minutes does it take for a person to commute to their place of work? Now we need to then we need to now visualize this data using a graph. With qualitative data, we had fixed uh, entities. So, like in here, we had California, Florida, New York, and Washington D.C. In quantitative data, we have numbers. So I could create a frequency chart of each number. So I could say frequency of let's say 5 is I could say count if and then I could put in the range and say it is 5 then it pops up as 1. Now I could do that for every number but some numbers appear just once and it may not be an easy thing to visualize. So one thing we can do is create bins or create ranges of numbers and find out how many numbers are in each of those ranges. In that case what we would do is write here bins and frequency in each bins. So the bins could be between 0 to let's say less than 15 minutes. I could have said 0 to less than 10 minutes or 0 to 10 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes. It's up to the person how they want to arrange their bins. And now I can do my frequency. So I will say count if the range. So I go up here and I highlight all the numbers. And then comma, my criteria is in quotes less than 15. And I get this number. So let me copy and paste the formula next to this number. So. Now the way Excel does it is that it can only do greater than or less than. So if I wanted to find the bin between 15 to 30, I would do 
equals to count if all these numbers comma and the criteria is less than 30 so this would give me the number of um, data points that are between 0 and 30 but I need the numbers between 15 and 30 so what I need to do is I need to subtract count if from this range the numbers between 0 and 15 and that gives me 11 so this count if is telling me that okay this is the number of observations that is between 15 and 30 to do it uh, to do between 30 and 45 let me just copy and paste this formula down here remove that quote and it will be less than 45 minus less than 30. So I get 8 here. And finally, if I wanted to find that of greater than 45, I can just look at this, bring this formula here, and say this is greater than or equal to 45. And let's remove this quote here. So greater than or equal to, let's just change the name so we are sure about all our names. And so this tells us the frequency of all the numbers of all the commute times. And again, we can add the numbers just to give us the idea how many people took the survey. So which is 27. And we can draw a bar chart with that, just like what we did before. So I go to insert, I go to a bar chart, and I get a nice bar chart. Now, just like before, I a frequency graph tells us, you know, we know that most people are commuting between 15 to 30 minutes to go to their workplace. Second highest is 30 to 45 minutes. And so this gives us some idea. And but again, if I wanted to look at percentages, it's probably best to convert this to relative frequency. So I will comp copy my bins value here. I'll write here relative frequency. And I will take each frequency for each of the bins, divide them by the total values, or total number of survey results. And then I get this number here. So just like before, I put a dollar sign between E and a dollar sign between 10, just so that, just to tell Excel that this number, the denominator stays the same. As I pull this number down, Excel should change the numerator, but not the denominator. And so if I draw this graph again, this will tell me what kind of, or what is the percentage of people in different or what is the percentage of the respondents in each of the bins. So we can see that almost a little over 40% of the people commute between 15 to 30, 30 minutes to go to work. A little less than 30% or almost 30% of the people commute between 30 to 45 minutes to go to work. Finally, we can also use scatter plots. This is if we have two different data sets and we want to see if there is a relationship between them. So one way of doing it is we highlight the data and then we go to insert and then right here we see a scatter we click on that and this is just telling us what is the relationship between these two numbers i can see here that if i actually draw a line the line seems to be going in an upward direction that means as one value go up the other value also goes up if one value goes down the other value also goes down. But we don't, here it may seem, okay, somewhat understandable that GPA is causing salary to go up, but it may not always be the case. We may not see that just from this correlation chart, we may not be able to deduce what is causing what. Now here we see that in our case, our graph is a little lopsided. I mean, it's all the values are in the, this upper right corner. We don't need so much empty space. So what I can do is I can right click on this, on the axes, and I can click on format axes. 
and then it tells me what's the minimum and maximum. So I can hear, I can see that all the numbers are between 20 and 60. So I can say for the y-axis, the minimum should be 20, and the maximum is 60 is fine. I can do the same thing for the x-axis. I can toggle down here and right click. And this is for a PC, for a Mac, it may be a little different, but I can click and I can right click on format access and I can do the same thing. The minimum, I can ask for the minimum to be two and the maximum to be 4.5, which is fine. Or I can bring it down to 4.1 and then now my graph looks like that. But here too, even after, you know, just looking at a truncated graph, I can still see that my scatter plot is showing an upward trend. So from here, we can say that there is a relationship between these two variables. It is a positive relationship. We don't, or we may, in this case, we may deduce that GPA is causing a rise in salary, but in other statistical or macroeconomic variables, we may not be able to show that. Now, there are other kinds of scatter plot too. We may have a negative relationship of a scatter plot, something like this. So we have x here and y here. So if the line goes like this, that's a negative relationship. And then there's also another relationship that we can look into, which is where there is no relationship. That is, if the lines go or if the dots go all over the place like this. That is, there is no really positive or negative relationship. So hopefully this was helpful. These are some of the ways we can visualize our data. There may be other ways we can visualize it more um, complicated and more tech savvy ways, but this is a nice start of showing how we could show our data in nice graphs. Hope everything goes well, and I will see you at a later video. Have a good day. Goodbye. Goodbye.